I had just become a Christian. I was very interested in studying the scriptures, talking to people. I was working as a display artist in South Africa. And uh, I came across a, a manageress whose daughter was going out with this boy whose father was uh, a preacher. But he was, in his own estimation, from what I could gather, he felt that he was more than a preacher. Because he claimed that the references in the Bible to the branch uh, applied to him. Now, I've never heard anything like that in my whole life. And <coughs> branch didn't mean that much to me either. Talk about the local church, or talk about the Lord's Supper, or talk about uh, uh, any of the, the ordinary subjects, baptism, <coughs> faith, and so forth. Uh, I, I could have come up with scriptures and uh, could have dealt with it. So uh, I, I looked up a scripture and uh, look at Isaiah chapter 4. <coughs> Verse 2, we read from verse 2, in that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth will be the pride of the adornment of the survivors of Israel. It will come about that uh, he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over our assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and a brightness of a flaming fire by night, for over all the glory will be a canopy, and there will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day, and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. <clears throat> so I read a passage like this, and I'm just more confused <laughs> because now I see there is a reference to branch in the scriptures, but I don't know what it is. And uh, I haven't got the wherewithal at that stage to, uh, to really research it because it was all in Old Testament and I felt the Old Testament is too difficult and I felt uh, I, I'm not getting a grip on it. I just have to leave it. I, I didn't have a discussion with that man because... Uh, I wouldn't have known how to defend the truth on the matter. But you see, I'm saying all of that just to show you that uh, you're at a stage in the early days when things are not all that clear, when subjects can be very hard, and if you're getting no help at all, the chances are you'll never understand the subject. And I was getting no help at all. I was, uh, it was one of those situations in South Africa where uh, you were putting on the deep end and you either swam or you sank. That, that was the way it was. You, 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 you swim yourself or you sink. That's uh, how it was. So you, you have to do a little bit of philandering around. Oh, I'm not philandering. <laughs> <It's a wrong laughs> <word. laughs> uh, I see I'm tired now. You'll have to forgive me because I'm not, uh, my mind isn't as clear as it uh, would usually be. But, uh, 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 you know, waving the hand, what is it? Treading water. Uh, yeah, treading water and that sort of thing. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, I've, uh, since then I've learned a few more scriptures and put the subject together a little bit better. So just follow with me and let's see if this branch applied to that chap in South Africa or if the Bible is talking about something else. <laughs> All right, Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. <laughs> then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of <coughs> counsel and strength the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor, and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. 
Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. <laughs> and the first thing uh, uh, you, you'd have to say when you read a passage of scripture like this is that any human being <coughs> making a claim to be the branch uh, and uh, would have to fit this description. And who, who is going to make a claim that they have the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of counsel and strength, uh, the decisions will not be decided by what he hears. Uh, in righteousness he will judge the poor. I tell you something, it's somebody with a huge ego that would say, I am the branch and these passages of scripture apply to me. Of course what we can see is uh, the person who would be this uh, branch would be a shoot <coughs> that would spring from the stem of Jesse. Now, we get, now we're getting somewhere. We're getting to, to, to something that we would understand in the scriptures. We know that David's father was Jesse. So this has to do with the promise made to David. So it's David <coughs> who is uh, the one that is referred to, or at least the descendant that would uh, sit on the throne of David forever and ever. And it's this one then who would uh, have the spirit of the Lord rest on him, who had the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see and so forth. So, <clears throat> so we, even with that now, we're, we're very strongly leaning towards uh, our Lord Jesus Christ as the one who is... <coughs> Uh, the branch and the, the root of the stock of Jesse and of his descendants there would be this one who was also uh, referred to many times in the Old Testament as David or the son of David and he was going to be the one who would fulfill uh, passages of uh, scripture like this. So now let's go ahead and let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. shepherds who were destroying the sheep of the Lord's pasture and uh, how he was going to bring uh, correction on them and it says in verse 3 then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and shall bring them back to their pasture and they will be fruitful and multiply I shall also write, rise up shepherds over them and they will tend them and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I shall rise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king, and act wisely, and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Again, we can see uh, this uh, ties in with the scripture that we were reading in Isaiah chapter 11, that this branch would be uh, from David, when I shall raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely. And the other hint that it is the Lord Jesus Christ is that uh, last part of <coughs> verse 6, where it says, and this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 might um, be of interest to you in, in this regard. Verses 30 and 31 says, But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So we've got a firm connection now with the uh, offspring of, or the seed of David. That one that God was going to raise up for David, who would sit on his throne, and who would rule wisely, act wisely, and rule wisely, and bring salvation to Judah and Israel, 
and bring righteousness to the people of Israel and to the rest of the world. Um, so we're, we're moving along. Jeremiah chapter 33 now. The old days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute ju justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days Judah shall be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell in safety. And this is the name by which uh, she shall be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priests shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to prepare sacrifices continually. So this righteous branch is... David's offspring. And David's offspring would rule as king and execute justice and righteousness on the earth. Those who belong to him, he will be called the Lord of righteousness, but she, which would refer to the church, would be called also the Lord as our righteousness. David would never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Now as we go through our study, we're going to see that this, uh, this promise, when it was applied to the actual descendants of David, like Solomon and, uh, and his son Rehoboam and Asa and uh, Abijah and all those others who succeeded uh, David, that that it was conditional for them. It was conditional on their faithfulness. And God really bore with them as long as he could uh, to continue that line of the firstborn so, that, uh, so, that, uh, to, so as to make it possible for the Christ to come uh, through that line. But what happened was uh, their wickedness got so bad that he had to, he, he, he finally decided to remove the kings altogether. And he made a promise uh, in Jeremiah chapter 22, actually, that uh, Coniah, who was the last one before the deportation to Babylon, that this Coniah, uh, incidentally, is, is, he has three Jeconiah, he's also called Jeconiah, um, and then he's called Jehoiachin. So just in case you're reading about Jehoiachin or Jeconiah or Coniah, you know they're all the same people. Just want to mention that because they are all, they're all the same king. Uh, I don't know why they had the three different names, but they, are, they have that three different names. The, the complication of it was his father's name was Jehoiakim. So <laughs> here you are, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Jeconiah, Coniah. <laughs> Who are we talking about here? You're all, you're all at sea when you start to read about these things. But it's, but it's interesting. He said to write this man down childless. Um, now that means, it didn't mean that he wasn't going to have a child, but he wasn't going to have a child that would sit on the, uh, on the throne of David in Jerusalem ruling. And, and so uh, it, it's interesting for us to know that uh, Coniah is in the genealogy of Jesus. <coughs> Matthew 1 verse 12 talks about Coniah and puts him in the genealogy of Jesus. So it, it suggests that Jesus could not come back to this earth and sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem and rule from Jerusalem because the Lord had given them a king in his anger and removed the kings in his wrath. But that didn't mean that, uh, that the line of David didn't continue. It did continue. It was just that there was no king sitting on the throne and ruling. It did continue. Uh, until the Christ came, who was the son of David, 
and who, by the proclamation of, of the angel when he told Mary that he would sit on the throne of his father David, that he would be the king that was promised, and that, uh, that all of those scriptures that made reference to David and his descendant to the branch and uh, his righteousness and kingship to his priesthood, it would all be fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go now to Zechariah chapter 3. children of Israel. Uh, and in verse 8 it says, now listen, Joshua the high priest, Joshua was, was the high priest at this time, and it's not Joshua who went into the land of Canaan and, and acted as the commander in chief of the armies and defeated the Canaanites. This is another Joshua, much, much later than that. Now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed, they are men who are a symbol for behold, I am going to bring in my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes, and they're usually a reference to the seven eyes of God, the all-seeing eye of God. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it and declare the Lord uh, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, Every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. So we can see the servant who was the branch, this, this descendant of David, who turns out to be Jesus Christ our Lord, is being promised here. And, uh, and in uh, giving this branch or, uh, to Israel, Iniquity would be removed from the land in one day. And of course, that has reference to the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that day, declares the Lord, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. Now, that was a picture in the Old Testament of a peaceful Israel, where the enemies were not attacking, where the land was being fruitful, where everybody was at peace, and uh, this uh, this inviting the neighbor to sit under the uh, vine and under the fig tree out of the shade of the sun and in order to enjoy just the luxury of the peace and the fellowship and the joy that was theirs at the time. So that was going to be the picture of what it was going to be like under Christ. Christ was going to bring this healing to us. Christ was going to be our peace and bring that peace to us. Now what we've got to understand as Christians is we're the recipients of all of these promises. These, these things are fulfilled in us. We are supposed to have the peace. The peace of Christ. We're supposed to be cleansed from our sins and know that we are being cleansed from all defilement of the flesh and of the spirit. We're the ones who are righteous and are and our name is, the, uh, the Lord is our righteousness, because we recognize that we are not righteous by our own doing, by all the deeds that we've done in righteousness, but that we are righteous through forgiveness. And that forgiveness is based on the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can truly say the Lord is our righteousness. We depend on him for forgiveness and for being and counting our faith as righteous we depend on him for the acceptance that we have before the father we will depend on him for uh, for the ability to to uh, be counted not guilty when it comes to judgment day so that we can be brought into heaven and hear the words well done good and faithful servant <clears throat> well done good and faithful servant um, I, I, I just do feel, when I read through the Old Testament, that the, the Jewish people, that, that is the faithful ones, were excited about all these promises. And they would look forward with great anticipation to the Messiah coming, and to what he was going to do for his people, and all of the privileges and all of the blessings that would be bestowed on them because of their association with Messiah. 
And I just feel that somehow or other we've missed the connection. Some that's, we're not quite connected to this and we're not realizing the enormity of the, the, the blessings that we have as the people of God in this present day. I'm just convinced of that. Uh, and I'm convinced because I don't know that I've got the connection back right yet either myself. And for that reason, I, uh, I, I'm working hard at putting it together and taping it up and getting it right. But uh, it, it just takes an enormous amount of effort. But if we, if we can get it right, and, and we get the flow of these prophecies and understand the blessings that are coming from them, it will just be a, a tremendous boost to our faith and to our joy and to our ability to thank God for what we've got and to realize how privileged we are as the people of God. All right, let's go to Zechariah chapter 6 now. <coughs> <clears throat> verse 12. Then say to him, he's talking to Joshua again, then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the honor of, uh, and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. Now this directly bears on Psalm 110, where the Messiah is, is, both, is referred to under the title of being king and of being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Those who know anything about the book of Hebrews know that this uh, psalm is applied to Jesus in the book of Hebrews. And he is the one whose priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus, as had been predicted here in Zechariah, was to build the temple of the Lord. And the temple wasn't going to be that physical bricks and mortar temple that uh, they would know under the Old Testament. This was the new spiritual temple where the people became the living stones, built a great, uh, upon the great cornerstone who was Jesus Christ himself. He is the foundation, and, and we are part of that building. So he would build this temple as he is doing right now, and we're a part of that. We are in that temple. We're a part of it. And he said he, he will uh, uh, bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne, which he does right now. Jesus is on the throne in heaven. Jesus is ruling on our behalf in heaven. <coughs> Jesus is, he, he is the king and the ruler of all creation, all created things, both in the heaven, in the heavens and on the earth. And he's our king, and he's our Lord, and he's intimately uh, associated with our lives. <coughs> If, if I tell you, if you were related to a king here on this earth, genuinely related, and were on talking terms with him, he wouldn't have any problem boasting to other people and saying, you know, the king of Siam here is a, <laughs> is a friend, a personal friend of mine. Yeah, and uh, we, we talk every week, and, uh, and uh, he sends me gifts, and everybody would be jealous because of that for a star day. He sends me gifts, and, uh, and we have this great relationship with each other, and he counts me as a son or as a daughter, and he comes and visits me. Why is it that if we had like, that physical relationship with some king who's nothing... Uh, more than the human, that we would feel so happy and so proud and so uh, so excited to tell other people about it and not feel ashamed of doing so. And yet when we have this association with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, because it's an act of faith, uh, it just seems to be that uh, it mean, doesn't mean that much. We're almost ashamed to say, I'm a Christian. I'm associated with Christ in that way. I talk to him every day. He's my life. He's my Lord. He's my righteousness. All the good that I receive in life comes from him. All the blessings of eternal life are in him. He is the great one. 
and I'm his friend. I'm his brother and I'm his, and you're his sister. We have that association. I think we need to see what we've got. I really do. I think we need to see what we've got. All right, uh, just to sort of conclude this section, just having gone through these scriptures, <laughs> it's obvious that this man in South Africa is not the branch. And that his ego was too big and his head was too big making a claim that he was the branch. Jesus Christ is the branch. And Jesus Christ is the one who is filled with the Spirit of God. And Jesus Christ is the one who is of the descendants of David. And Jesus Christ is the one who holds the kingship and the priesthood all at the same time. Jesus Christ is the only one who could fulfill all of these prophecies and has fulfilled all of these prophecies. And for that reason then, we need to know that the branch, if it ever is brought up in your, your hearing, you will know what, uh, what the Bible teaches about it, and you will be able to say, even if you're not able to put your finger on the scriptures that I've just used, you'll be able to say, no, the branch is Jesus Christ our Lord, and I can bring you the information, and if you want me to give you these scriptures, I'll give them to you so that you can bring the information to those people. Okay, now... In, in the same vein, all of this stems from uh, the promise that God made to David. When David wanted to build a temple for the Lord, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8, Samuel chapter 7 is what <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it says in verse 1, Now it came about when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. <clears throat> You've got to hand it to David, he was a very thoughtful man, and his thoughts always seem to begin and end with God. And he decided he's living in a house of cedar, and the Lord's, the ark of the Lord is only in a, in a tent, uh, covered with cloths and uh, skins and so forth. And he thought, that's not right. That surely is not right. At the very least, he needs to have a house like mine, and uh, in David's mind, he would feel, no, he needs to have a better house than mine. So he decides that he would. Uh, he decided to ask Nathan, who was the prophet at the time, uh, uh, what what he should do. He revealed to him what was in his mind, and Nathan just thought, "You're right, David. Absolutely right. You just go and do everything that's in your mind." Now Nathan should have known better. He should have asked the Lord first. He just thought. It's a good idea. Let's go along with it. I just want to use this. Now, it's outside of the lesson, but I do want to say it to you because there's all sorts of ideas that originate in our minds as to what we should do for the Lord. And, uh, and, and especially there are people who have grandiose ideas of great works which they could accomplish for the Lord if they could have their way and they could work the church to do what they think should be done so that many more people would be converted, the Lord would be glorified, the church would be bursting at the seams, and everybody would be happy. Now we've had a few of those down through the years who have, have started schemes and, and, uh, and have been doing things which the Lord never gave us permission to do. And there's been lots of prophets like Nathan or preachers and teachers who have given the okay to it because they felt, surely that can't be wrong. Surely that can't be wrong. But it came about in the night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? 
For I have not dwelt in the house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus uh, you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from the day I have commanded you to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will rise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, he doesn't say it here. Uh, he uh, tells us in First uh, Chronicles or se uh, yeah, First Chronicles 17, that uh, that David was not going to build his house because David was a man of the Lord. He had shed too much blood in his life. He was a man of war, and the Lord said no to him. But he says you can you can make the preparations. It'll be your son Solomon who will build this house. Okay. But now David had a good heart, and the Lord responded to his goodness by saying, "Look, you're not going to build a house for me. I'm going to build a house for you, an enduring house, a house that will last forevermore." Now David was totally overwhelmed with this. Uh, you can read yourself in your own time from verse 18 onwards, where David goes in before the Lord, and he's uh, he's telling he's he's just responding to what the Lord has promised him. He's totally overwhelmed by it, and he's so grateful to the Lord for even considering doing a thing like this for him. Um, but he was grateful, and he accepted what the Lord was going to do for him. Now, uh, all all of this uh, this is. Uh, this is God's promise to David. As I said, First, first uh, Chronicles chapter 17 deals with this again so that, uh, so that there's a repeat of the story and little details, as in the Gospels, details that were not maybe recorded in Samuel are recorded for us in First Chronicles chapter 17. Uh, there, it, it's, what I want to do now is uh, there's, there's a suggestion <coughs> that uh, this promise was so important to the, to the children of Israel that, uh, that in various circumstances they used this promise to try and bolster the faith of the people uh, that they were dealing with. Um, let's have a look now, let's see here. Uh, first of all, Second Chronicles chapter 6. Chronicles chapter 6 verse 14 and he said this is Solomon now confirming that the Lord had uh, fulfilled the promise which he had made about one of his sons sitting on his throne and building this uh, temple or this house for the Lord. He said O Lord the God of Israel there is no God like you in heaven or on earth keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all their heart who has kept with your servant David, my father, that which you have promised him. Indeed, you have spoken with your mouth and have fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Now, therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with your servant David, my father, that which you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your sons take heed to their way to walk in my law as you have walked before me. All right. As you can see, that promise to the kings was conditional. They needed to walk 
in his ways uh, and uh, as David had walked in God's ways uh, before Solomon. Solomon, of course, didn't do that, unfortunately. He just didn't do it. And he was the first one to move the people away from the Lord and get them back into idolatry. How, how, I mean, it, was, it says that the women influenced him. But how he could be so stupid as to allow the women to influence him after it says that he was the wisest man who ever lived. I think it's just, uh, it's just like another lesson for, for, for us all that, listen, uh, yes, your wife should influence you. And godly women should influence you. But we're both, both, all of what God says should be the greatest influence in your life. Just listen to the Lord. And uh, because we can all make mistakes, and people can be making suggestions out of uh, out of a good heart, but not necessarily out of a, a how would I say a, a, out of a single-minded approach to doing God's will. In other words, having a scripture for everything that we do. So you can be led astray, and it's easy to be led astray. Let let us not be led astray. <coughs> Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 13. Abijah was on the throne now. He was <coughs> the grandchild of Solomon. Uh, and uh, Jeroboam was still on the throne in, in the northern part of Israel. Now they, they drew up to... Uh, to have a fight with each other, a war with each other. And according to verse 3, uh, Abijah had 400,000 chosen men, uh, but Jeroboam drew up in battle formation against him with 800,000 chosen men who were valiant warriors. Uh, Abijah stood on Mount uh, Zamor Zamoraim, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, and he said, listen to me, Jerobo Jeroboam and all Israel. Now, I want you to listen to this because what he's saying here now is he's, he's delineating what Jeroboam was doing with his false gods and now uh, what they were doing as they were <coughs> remained faithful to God. And he says this now is, is not just a, a, a clash of personalities here. This is a, not just a clash of cultures. This is a clash of an idolatrous people against the people who are going to be faithful to the Lord. And you can see why God had to support uh, Abijah. Uh, I don't know that he was altogether that great a man, but he had to support that cause because it was his cause. And he had to demonstrate to all Israel, whether it was those ten tribes that went with uh, Jeroboam uh, or the two tribes that were left to Abijah, uh, that God was with the ones who were faithful to him and not with the ones who were unfaithful to him. Uh, it says, uh, let's go down to uh, verse 8. So now you intend to resist the kingdom of the Lord uh, through the sons of David, being a great multitude and having with you the golden calves which Jeroboam made for gods for you. Now you see, out in the battlefield now, um, Jeroboam, they, they, they had brought down the gods, the gods that had been made for them by Jeroboam. And he says, have you not driven out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and made for yourselves priests like the people of other lands? Now this shows you when we enter into apostasy, where we go, we become like the other religions around us. There's nowhere else to go. If you move away from the Lord, you're not moving in any right direction. You're, you're moving in the wrong direction. You're going to be moving in the direction of the world, not in the direction of heaven or God or God's word. You're going to be listening to men and their, and their ideas and, and their ideas about religion. And that's exactly what they did here. They drove out the priests, the true priests, Aaron and the Levites. And he says... Whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams, even he may become a priest of what are no gods. So you could buy the priesthood now. You could become a priest, uh, and if you just had the right offerings, they would allow you to be a priest. He says, that's how far removed you've gone from God's appointment. 
God says Aaron and his sons, the tribe of Levi, were separated uh, for the purpose of serving in the temple. And the sons of Aaron, in particular, were the ones who were to be priests before the Lord. But all that went by the wayside. It was anybody can buy it if they've got enough money and they can be just a priest if they want to be a priest, if they feel they've got the call. <coughs> He said in verse 10, But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the sons of Aaron are ministering to the Lord as priests, and the Levites attend to their work. Every morning and evening they burn uh, to the Lord burnt offerings and fragrant incense, and the showbread is set out on the clean table, and the golden lampstand with its lamps is ready uh, to light every evening. For we have kept the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Now behold, God is with us at our head, and his priests with the signal trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O sons of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you will not succeed. Now, it did look like they were going to. Jeroboam had set an ambush, and there was uh, troops before them, and what they found, the, the Judeans found there was troops behind them. They were, uh, actually, they were outmaneuvered straight away. Jeroboam outmaneuvered them. But they call on the Lord. They call on the Lord in their distress, and the Lord delivered them. And Jeroboam and his army were routed. God proving again just how strong God Almighty is. And it was, it was on the basis that they were faithful, the faithful servants of God, the descendants of David, the ones who were keeping the... The, the commandments of Moses and showing by their everyday behavior in their priesthood, in their sacrifices, uh, and in the way they behaved, that they were the children of God and would maintain that status because, excuse me, God would look after them. But of course, if it had remained that faithful, things would have been great. But they didn't remain that faithful. And we have a typical king in Jehoram. Uh, if you go to Second Chronicles 21 now. <clears throat> Verse 6. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab did, for Ahab's daughter was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant which he had made with David. And since he had promised to give a lamb to him and his sons forever. So here was the promise. And even though you had men like Jehoram on the throne, God continued to be patient, continued to be kind, continued to work with them until that point, as I say in Jeremiah chapter 22, where uh, Coniah just reached the climax and God could continue with them no more. And he removed Coniah from the throne, reporting him to Babylon, and there was none of his descendants would prosper sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem. None of them. That was the promise that he had made there. All right. There are a huge amount of other scriptures. Jeremiah chapter 30, uh, Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel chapter 37, all describing the king, the shepherd, the uh, descendants of David uh, and so forth, all which are fulfilled in the present day. I just don't have the time to go through all of that. But I just want you to see how that it was, how important it was to receive these promises for the children of Israel, for us to receive these promises as God-given promises, and to see that in our day and time, not only did the angel uh, see the fulfillment or make the promise that the fulfillment would be in Christ Jesus our Lord. When, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he summarizes all of those promises and shows us how they were fulfilled in Jesus Christ in his resurrection from the dead, in his ascension into heaven, in his coronation as king, uh, enthroned in heaven on the, the throne of David, who rules in heaven amidst his enemies uh, and whose people will volunteer, uh, vol volunteer freely to him in the day of his reign or in the day of his rule. So, so if that's the scene for us. We are the recipients of all these blessings and uh, we are the ones who should know 
what these blessings are, what these prophecies are, how they are fulfilled, and we need to have a grasp on them so that when any false teaching comes up in regard to the prophecies uh, and their application in the New Testament, we have some idea as to how to counteract them, counteract them, and some idea as to how to tell the people they are wrong, and here's what the Bible teaches about these passages. All right, I know it's technical. Uh, I know it's probably even difficult because it's, uh, it's dry, dry and technical stuff, but it's important stuff. Everything that God has revealed to us is important, and if we can get a grip on it, uh, and don't worry, it won't be the last lesson I'll ever teach on it, but uh, for the moment it will. Uh, I hope it's been helpful, and I hope some things have stuck with you for today.